Hello there, my fellow battle brothers, and welcome to your weekly dose of the Space Marine Chapters lore. For today, I somehow, once again, managed to find another canon chapter to cover. These guys are known as the Obsidian Glaives. They are a pretty obscure chapter, although they do have a sad story that deserves being told. Unfortunately, I could only find like one picture on them, and it was not their chapter badge. So I'll have to use pictures associated with the other chapters of their gene line. I'm your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us hear their story, shall we? The Obsidian Glaives was a successor chapter of the Ultramarines. Founded in the Dark Days after the Horus Heresy, they were a primogenitor chapter created as early as the Second Founding. It was at the end of the 41st millennium that the Orc warlord Grok Faceripa and his Red Wa would plow into the densely populated Sanctus Reach subsector. By the time the Orc reached the Sanctus Reach, he had billions of Orcs following in his way. Just a few obstacles were standing in his way, most notably the world of Obsteria, home to the Obsidian Glaze chapter. There were five companies of the chapter defending the planet, led by the chapter master Midnius. Despite the numbers of Grok, Midnius had assured the Imperial Sector Lord that he could halt the invasion before it plunged deeper into the subsector. Even before Grok reached Obsteria though, freebooters and mobs of the Evil Sons raced ahead to be the first ones to attack the Space Marines. One Captain Duckbad Flamegut was the first one to descend upon the planet, his kill cruisers charging at the Obsidian Glaze orbital defenses. Hundreds of thousands of orcs reached the surface of the planet through a hail of anti-aircraft fire, and then laid siege to the Penumbral Spike the fortress monastery of the chapter. In the ten millennia since the founding of the chapter, this had never fallen to a foe. But soon, orcs were scaling the walls, bellowing war cries while the space marines blasted at them from above. Many times the orcs bludgeoned or shot their way into the fortress, Midnius personally leading counterattacks to throw them back. And for seven days and nights the obsidian glaives held back the orcs, the loss of each fallen battle brother keenly felt. In a desperate ploy, Chapter Master Midnius brought with him the final weapon to be deployed out of the chapter's armory. The Ancients of the Vaults, the Dreadnoughts. No less than eleven of them storming onto the battlements in a tide of steel. During that epic engagement, Midnius faced Flame God himself and managed to kill him. This would shatter the morale of his forces. By the dawn of the eighth day, the tide of the orcs seemed to slacken, leaving the space marines to count their dead, which included all but one of the dreadnoughts. The onslaught of the orcs had been temporarily halted, but the chapter master knew this would not last long. And then Grok arrived with his proper war. At a slaughter of Black Gulch, Grok famously tore open a malfunctioning drop pod to get at the space marines inside. He then cut all ten of them into pieces one by one in a series of increasingly brutal kills. It was such an ignoble fate that the commanders of the chapter's battle company, with the assent of Chapter Master Midnius, authorized the revenge strike upon Grok himself. But despite inflicting severe damage, the Space Marines were unable to complete the mission. The Battle of Black Gulch was Midnius's final attempt to kill Grok. In the beginning, the Space Marines caught the Orcs by surprise, killing thousands of them as they fell upon the Horde. But then the numbers of the Orcs started to tell. Into their midst, Midnia soared, roaring across the battlefield on a jump pack to engage Grok, his blade moving in a blur to hack off the Orcs' head. Grok turned at the last moment, taking the blow to his thickly armored shoulder, roaring in pain. As Midnius raised his blade for another strike, Grok lashed out and wrapped a meaty fist around the blade. The chapter master strained with his considerable might against the orc to free the weapon, but Grok pivoted against the space marine's weight and delivered a thunderous uppercut which tore his helm from his head. Grok wrapped a massive hand around Midnius's body then, pinning his arms to his sides. 
The massive orc's mouth yawned open, revealing rows of gory fangs leading to a hungry black throat. The warlord closed his massive jaw, severing the chapter master's head from his body. And thus, the obsidian glaives were ended. Their commander dead, the space marines bravely attempted to defend their planet for another three days, fighting a battle they could not hope to win against the overwhelming tide of the orcs. Rather unusually, the chapter used to recruit its neophytes from criminal youths who had been sentenced to death. A youth would be brought to the Chapter Fortress Monastery and placed in a dimly lit cell, shackled with manacles on the wrists, ankles, and throat. Prayers of admonition and penance were inscribed upon the cell walls. Chaplains would preach to the youths on an hourly basis. Finally, one of them would offer the youth a chance to be punished appropriately in proportion to their heinous crime. They would not be executed, but they would go on to live an entire life of punishment. It would not be punishment via pain, for pain could be adapted to and ignored. It would be a punishment of service that would never end. Even at death they would not be finished. It was a true punishment as befitted a crime the youth had committed against the Imperium. If the youth showed general remorse and the willingness to accept this punishment, the chapter would then take him out of the cell to be ground down and broken and rebuilt into something worthy. Once he had accepted his fate, he would be given over to the apothecaries to receive the first of the genesied organs of the chapter. Following the first of many surgeries, if the aspirant's body accepted the implants, he would be taken to face the final trial. The aspirant would be transported to the Black Gulch, one of the few routes by foot into the foothills around the chapter's fortress monastery, the Penumbro Spike. For someone without the genetic augmentations of an obsidian glaive, or whose augmentations had not yet begun to fully function, it was little better than a death sentence. Exposed to the harsh radiation of the world, most recruits would walk the path in the night, when the radiation was less severe. Even so, their bodies would be saturated by it, covering their bodies, shoulders and scalps with burns. If a recruit could not find any shade from the radioactive sun, he would simply die. The obsidian glaives didn't welcome recruits who were willing to lie down on the scalding rocks and accept death. If they were fortunate enough to find such a refuge, and found it occupied by another recruit, often they were forced to fight to the death for it. Those that survived and arrived at the gates of the Penumbra Spike would go on to continue living a life of unending punishment. The chapter felt that those aspirants who fell by the wayside deserved only death, as had been their initial sentence. The chapter homeworld was the deadly irradiated world of Obsteria. Although it was an imperial world, the harsh conditions to this inhospitable planet never successfully allowed for colonization. Instead, the planet was given to the Obsidian Glaives as a personal domain. The harsh radiation of this planet was known to greatly affect the dreadnoughts of the chapter. The space in flesh, ironically, was temporarily proof against the radiation, but the same could not be said about the antiquated technology. The connection between the sarcophagus of a dreadnought and the pilot used technology that could not be replicated, but those connections degraded with exposure to the radiation of the homeworld and with them, the faculties of the pilot's mind as well. Because of this degradation, many of the dreadnought pilot's minds had been slowly poisoned, affecting their hold on reality. Many times they would cause the dreadnought to believe they were reliving events from the past, centuries or even millennia earlier, when they still walked among the Battle Brothers as regular Astartes. Within their stasis vault, asleep, they were protected, when active on the surface of Obsteria, the degradation continued, and as it worsened, the speed of the decay accelerated. Very few had even seen the inside of the vault, outside of the high-ranking officers of the chapter and the tech marines maintaining it. The vault was clad in cold steel, the only chamber in the spike not to be walled with the living rock of the mountain. It was here that twelve enormous pedestals stood each one topped by a cradle of archaic machinery and wreathed in cold vapor. In eleven of these was a dreadnought, the black armor of each covered in heraldry and battle honors spanning thousands of years of the chapter. 
A series of marks in high Gothic numerals were scrawled on the dreadnought sarcophagi. These marks were a means for the attending tech marines to determine how long each dreadnought had until he ceased to function. They were rotated out as an honor guard as they degraded, and their duty was to last a standard year or more. After that they would be sent back to the vault to await their next rotation once more. The entire culture of the Obsidian Glaives was centered around punishment. While other chapters considered their service to the Emperor and the Imperium a sacred duty, the Obsidian Glaives saw it as a form of never-ending punishment for their sins and their failures, both self-appointed and perceived. They would seek to offer penance for these shortcomings through the continuation of their service as a space marine. It was not uncommon for battle brothers of this morose chapter to punish themselves with self-mortification of the flesh, or by exposing themselves, unarmored, to the deadly radiation of the planet's sun. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about these obsidian glaives and their tragic end for today. Definitely one of the less positive thinking chapters of the setting, but at least they were loyal and went out defending the Imperium. Although I'm sure there was a way for them to survive too if they used a different tactic. What about you though? What are your thoughts on these obsidian glaives? Did you ever hear about them prior to today? Do share any thoughts or questions you may have in the comments below. If you found the episode informative or entertaining, please click the like, share and subscribe buttons for future content. Thanks a lot and have a healthy awesome day. The Emperor protects.